What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson, and the Senior Bowl has begun. The practices have started. Joe Shane is down in Mobile, Alabama, scouting some of these top prospects at the Senior Bowl. Of course, we know quarterbacks coach Shea Tierney is an offensive coordinator for the national team at the Senior Bowl, so he's getting a first-hand look at some of the top prospects at the Senior Bowl. And Joe Shane, down there in Mobile, met with some of the reporters who were there today, Dropped a few quotes that were really interesting, a little bit eye-opening. First of all, he said that he's going to meet with Saquon Barkley's representatives at the NFL Scouting Combine in March. That's something to keep an eye on as we get closer and closer to the Combine. Know that that means we're also getting closer and closer to the Giants beginning their negotiations with Saquon Barkley. Shane said that he met with Barkley at the end of the season briefly, but decided, the two of them decided, that they were going to continue their conversations with Barkley's representative at the Combine. So now you have a deadline, and that's when the Giants are going to begin their talks with Saquon Barkley. Now, on top of that, in other news, Dan Duggan of The Athletic dropped what might be considered a bombshell report today, kind of discussing what he's hearing, some of his predictions around the quarterback position for the New York Giants, and how he believes that if Joe Shane is convicted on any of those players, if he feels convinced that one of those guys is the next Josh Allen he's going to make a move up to trade for him or at least try his damn best to do so. And I think that was a pretty eye-opening takeaway from Dan Duggan's article today. So we're going to go ahead and dive into all of that. The Senior Bowl news, Joe Shane's quotes, and of course the Duggan article in today's episode. But before we dive into all that, make sure to leave a like if you do enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts on the topics down below in the comment section. If you're listening to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review and go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. But without further ado, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And what are your thoughts on, first of all, like, let's get your thoughts on Saquon Barkley and the New York Giants meeting with him at the scouting combine in March. Well, I'm doing pretty well. And as we know, there's a lot of information coming out about the Giants expect Daniel Jones to be the starter come opening day or week one or training camp next year. And, you know, we know Joe Shane has to say these things and I wouldn't really take it at face value. I'd probably look at it and say, hey, um, expecting could change to hoping to maybe to competing. You know what I mean? Like he could be competing with a rookie quarterback next year come training camp. And uh, for now, Joe Shane's not going to give us any um, insight into his hand of the draft. Obviously, the last two years, he's been pretty careful about any information leaking. We really did not hear much about who he was taking over the past two years. You know, we we didn't hear anything about Deontay Banks. We heard nothing really about Kayvon or um, Evan Neal. We hoped we talked about them for sure, but we didn't really hear much insight into it. So we know that Joe Shane has pretty good at keeping a straight face during this big poker match. And, you know, he's not going to give us any information on Daniel Jones right now. I mean, truth is, um, how much faith can you really have in a guy coming off an ACL tear and obviously a, a year, I mean, one neck injury removed from um, kind of being done, his career being over? How much faith can you have in a guy like that to take you to a championship? I personally wouldn't put my stock, wouldn't put my chips in it. Um, so I think there is a lot of val validity to Joe Shane considering quarterback options. A lot from this uh, Duggan article we'll talk about. But when it comes to Saquon Barkley, the Giants obviously haven't had much communication with Saquon Barkley's agents. They're expecting to meet with him at the Combine. And Saquon's market's going to be interesting, guys. So, you know, as we know, running backs really aren't um, – getting paid the way that they used to. Miles Sanders got $6 million per season last year. That was like the biggest deal on the market. And Anthony, you know as much as I do, Miles Sanders barely played this season for Carolina. They really relied on Chuba Hubbard. And I think that's a really big indication that teams are like, look, the one like re reasonable contract that a team gave out to running back in Miles Sanders ended up being complete dud. Now you can make the argument like, oh, like Christian McCaffrey's helping um, dominate with the 49ers. But guys, Christian McCaffrey is one, the best running back in football. And two, has arguably the best run blocking ahead of him. So, you know, plus a foundation that's built around uh, offensive success and maintaining drives. Um, you know, Christian McCaffrey's a monster. He's a, he's a unicorn. A lot of people could can make the you know same designation about Saquon Barkley. He's a unicorn, but the truth is the Giants don't even have close to the amount of offensive firepower that the 49ers do, and they certainly don't have the offensive line. So if you're the Giants looking at Saquon Barkley, you're saying to yourself, how much is fair? Saquon wants fair, and who who the hell is going to give him a big deal? Like if you think about the teams that are actually in contention right now. They don't really need running backs, right? The Lions have Jameer Gibbs and Jordan Montgomery. The Chiefs have Isaiah Pacheco. Like a lot of these really good teams, the Bills have James Cook. Who really needs a star running back to get them to the next level? 
I think that's a question we have to be asking ourselves. What team actually needs a running back right now that expects to be competitive in 2024? Um, I don't necessarily know. Like, I, I, I can't sit here and tell you that I can think of a team off the top of my head that needs a running back that badly. I think the Cowboys, they could just bring back uh, Tony Pollard, who's been really good for them. The Ravens don't necessarily need Saquon Barkley, but he'd be pretty cool, actually, in Baltimore. I don't think they want to pay him, though, because, you know, they got J.K. Dobbins. We'll see if he comes back. Um, but looking at other teams, Houston has, you know, Devin Singletary is going to be a, a free agent. Maybe they want to go out and get Saquon, pair Saquon with C.J. Stroud. That could be interesting. Um, I don't know. Like, it really depends on what a team is looking for in terms of, uh, you know, pairing a rookie quarterback with a, another player. But, you know, if, if you could point to a team right now, Anthony, who do you think is going to be in contention to even sign Saquon? Is it Because if, if you're Saquon and you want a big deal or do you want to win? You know what I mean? Because I don't think you're going to be able to get both. I think he's going to have to take a more favorable deal if he wants to go win on a championship team. But if he wants to get paid, he's probably going to have to go to one of the more questionable teams in football. How do you see this kind of unfolding for him? Uh, it's kind of hard to predict how it's going to unfold. If you want to ask me what team do I think would be interested in him, the first kind of name that rings to my mind is the Chicago Bears. I think the Chicago Bears have been kind of seeking playmakers for a while and have always been interested in adding some extra superstars to the mix. Of course, they made that trade last year with the first overall pick, landed themselves DJ Moore. They still have Justin Fields. If they're continuing with him, they're either going to want to continue to rely on a run-heavy attack with Fields, which would pave the way for Saquon Barkley to have a pretty substantial role in that offense, or even if they bring in a rookie quarterback like Caleb Williams, it doesn't hurt to have a superstar running back in the backfield with him and just give him extra playmakers. So the Chicago Bears would make sense to me. They've got the money for it. Um, honestly, hate to say it, but in the division, the Washington Commanders have so much money this upcoming offseason to spend. It's disgusting. I think they have like $76 million in salary cap space, so they can pretty much sign whoever the F they want. And if Saquon Barkley does hit the open market, I think that they would try to make a statement, pair Saquon Barkley up with whoever they can at quarterback as a rookie uh, in Washington and make sure that he faces off against the Giants twice a year. I think that's something that Washington would be heavily interested in because they just have so much money that they can spend. Now, in terms terms of contenders, where could Saquon Barkley go if he wants to win and go to the playoffs? I guess Pittsburgh Steelers maybe, although I don't think they have a ton of cap space. I know the Miami Dolphins were interested in him before the trade deadline. However, they seem to have their running back room pretty much sorted out. Eagles wouldn't really be a sound option. Tampa Bay's got a good backfield. The Rams never invest that kind of money in their backfield. Even with Todd Gurley, they got to add of that contract as soon as they possibly could. I guess Dallas makes sense if you want to listen to Cole Beasley. There's some landing spots out there for him, but really what I'm most worried about with the New York Giants at Saquon Barkley is kind of what happens if he leaves? How does that affect the locker room? And I know that we've discussed that a few times, Alex, where we feel that Saquon Barkley and Xavier McKinney, two of the Giants, the two the Giants' two biggest impending free agents, were their two biggest leaders in the locker room this past season. So really, it's they kind of have to play this kind of game here, weigh the pros and cons of signing Saquon Barkley and one of the major cons that they need to consider is the effect on the locker room and the lack of leadership that they will have without him uh, especially when you consider Daniel Jones I know there's a lot of criticism for Daniel Jones and we're about to talk about this quarterback situation in, in a second Alex but Daniel Jones is also one of their leaders however he's injured and he's not on the practice field with them all the time anymore until he's fully recovered which might not be until the regular season has already kicked off so without him without Saquon Barkley who's your leader on offense I guess it's Andrew Thomas Thomas, but he's not the most vocal leader in that bunch. Sterling Shepard is one of your leaders. He's not going to be back next season. So who, who is your leader in this New York Giants offense if you don't re-sign Saquon Barkley? I think that's a really valid question to ask. It doesn't seem like Mike Kafka is their leader either. It sounds like there was a lot of kind of back and forth with Kafka throughout the year. Wide receivers coach Mike Groh got into it with Darius Slayton on the sideline. So I don't really believe that any of those coaches, coordinators, assistant coaches are the leaders for that offense. I truly believe, and I pinpointed down the leader for that team, and especially on the offensive side of the ball, is Saquon Barkley. So when we're asked about you know whether or not we think they should resign him, maybe I agree with you, and I don't believe that paying a running back is the wisest idea. Maybe I don't think that it's a good investment, but I don't think you can afford to let Saquon Barkley walk if you're the New York Giants because of the leadership in the locker room. You need a guy out there who can wear that captain's patch with honor and lead this team, hype them up, and know that you're a dependable superstar that's always going to be there for your boys. I think the Giants offense needs that, and Saquon Barkley is that. And without him, I don't know what they have. So signing Saquon Barkley might not be a necessity because they need playmakers on offense. It might just be a necessity because they need leaders in the locker room. And ultimately, I do believe that that's what they're going to discuss when they meet at the Combine 
and that will be the reason why he gets a long-term contract extension with the New York Giants. So moving on to the other topic of discussion, though, Alex kind of got the Saquon Barkley discussion out of the way. Let's talk about that Dan Duggan article because I thought it was really interesting. It had a lot to say about Joe Shane and kind of his thought process and mindset going into this offseason. So to clarify on the quotes from Joe Shane uh, earlier today, the first and foremost thing that he said was he still expects Daniel Jones to be the starter next season if he's healthy. Now, the thing that I will point out here is the wording. He said that the expectation, quote, expectation, is that Daniel Jones will be the starter. I'm not sure if you guys remember, but after the end of the regular season, the first end of season press conference that Brian Dable and Joe Shane did together, Brian Dable said the quote expectation is that Wink Martindale will be our defensive coordinator in 2024. Essentially, what that means is that there is no guarantee to this equation. There is no guarantee that Wink Martindale is going to be here, Mike Kafka is going to be here, that Daniel Jones is going to be here, or is going to be the starter. There is no guarantee, but it is the expectation because they haven't made any other moves just yet. But then he was asked, will you consider drafting a quarterback? He said, well, of course, we're going to look at all positions across the board and everything is on the table and we will not rule out drafting a quarterback. So for me, reading between the lines here and kind of picking up on what the New York Giants are saying... It comes down to two things. Number one, Joe Shane, the Giants, they do not benefit at all, any way whatsoever, by saying Daniel Jones is our starting quarterback and we're sticking with him. Doing that, all it does is maybe gives Daniel Jones a little bit of extra confidence, but I'll tell you a few things that it also does. It might deter some free agents who don't have a great perspective on Daniel Jones and don't have a high opinion of him. Maybe you want to bring in a pass catcher this offseason. They sign with the team under the assumption that they're going to draft a quarterback. But they're not signing under the assumption that Daniel Jones is going to be the quarterback. Some guys don't want to play with him. That's fine. That's one uh, example of a reason why you don't say it. The other reason would be the New York Giants going into that upcoming draft, they don't want teams to know what they're doing. They don't want teams to know who they're drafting. Because if all of a sudden the Joe Shane comes out and says, yeah, we're targeting a quarterback in the first round. Well, what's going to happen? Teams are going to trade up in front of the New York Giants and draft who they want. Or the Giants are going to call up and say, hey, can we trade up and try and move up for this pick so we can get this quarterback? They're going to say, nope, we already know that that's what you want to do. We're going to give it to this other team. There's no benefit to Joe Shane saying Daniel Jones is our starting quarterback next season. So that's number one. Now, number two, the second thing to consider here is Joe Shane is very comfortable being aggressive, trading up and finding his own quarterback. And I think when you read between the lines on what he said here, yes, the expectation is that Daniel Jones will be the starter. If they're not able to trade up, not able to land their quarterback, then what he said is true. Daniel Jones is the starter. But if they are able to trade up, he would just say, that was the expectation. Expectations change like they did with Wink Martindale. So that's my interpretation of those two quotes from Joe Shane. But Alex, I know that you have more quotes from the Dan Duggan article from The Athletic that you want to dive into, particularly about that trade up that I just kind of alluded to there. So why don't you take it away and give us some of those quotes and your analysis of them? Well, look, like you said, when it comes to Joe Shane saying the expectation is, he's used that exact same term as you mentioned with Wink Martindale um, and Daniel Jones multiple times before. To me, it's all just words, right? Like anything before the draft is just words. Obviously, let's let's point to the obvious thing here. There's a very good chance that the Bears and the Patriots in Washington take three consecutive quarterbacks. The only team that realistically is going to move back is the Bears. And the Bears, I mean, they have to have some pretty big balls to pass on whoever they want at quarterback number one overall. <clears throat> However, you could sell the, the story, you could sell the bill of goods that trading back, getting substantial, not just like a little bit, substantial draft capital, um, they can build around Justin Fields for the next two years a really strong roster. Like not just a good roster, but a really strong roster full of young, um, you know, very, very cheap, uh, you know, obviously talent and players. And if they want to go in that direction, maybe, you know, they'll be able to afford Fields because they'll have cheap pass rush, cheap corners, cheap everything, cheap receivers. They can get Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors and anyone. They can have a, such a cheap roster. And if Justin Fields doesn't work out, they can just go and get the best free agent or, or maybe wait for the draft. They'll have so much draft capital. They can reset anyway next year or the year after that um, if they pick up Fields' fifth-year option. So there's definitely a, a logic behind actually acquiring those draft picks and then sticking with Justin Fields. But passing on an elite quarterback with upside or elite prospect uh, for what it's worth is definitely something that would be hard to give up on. But Joe Shane definitely had some interesting quotes in this one. Um, you kind of listed some of them, but the one that really kind of stood out to me was talking about how 
if the Giants spend a little, if they don't go out and get a big reserve, like a big uh, kind of like a Tyrod Taylor-esque backup, there's a really tr- like real possibility here, a probability that they're going to draft the quarterback to be the backup for Daniel Jones and develop behind the scenes. I know Connor Hughes said they could do the Green Bay method. I want to kind of put that to bed for a second because there are two major differences differences between what the Giants have and the Green Bay method. One, I don't think Joe Shane has three years to get it, get it figured out at quarterback. I think he has one, maximum two years. The second thing is, we don't have Aaron Rodgers sitting by, uh, in front of a young quarterback to learn from. You really want our young quarterback learning from Daniel Jones? I mean, it's not the same thing. It's not even in the same realm. So I don't really see that correlation. I don't see that you know comparison at all. I think they're going to have to do the Giants model, which is either trading up and getting the top quarterback they can possibly get or taking a flyer on a guy who needs to be ready to play in 2025. Because, you know, they'll have him and Daniel Jones. They can compete for it. Daniel Jones will probably win the battle. He'll be the bridge. The rookie will sit and learn. And then they take over the year after that. But the Giants have to have a lot of confidence that they can find the guy that they like. Some people will think it's J.J. McCarthy. Others will think it's Michael Penix. I'm not a Bo Nix fan, personally. Um, I think that, you know, the Giants have a couple of options with tools they could go after and try to develop. But they kind of have to win right now. Like, stashing J.J. McCarthy behind Daniel Jones, and I think J.J. McCarthy needs at least two years to get to where he actually needs to be, where he can run a competent NFL offense, um, is a huge gamble. You know what I mean? You're better off. And for what it's worth, J.J., a lot of people think he's going to go in the first round. So, like, how are you going to get J.J. McCarthy unless you trade back? And that means passing on, like, Brock Bowers, Malik Neighbors. That means passing on an asset that can help you win now. So, Duggan is kind of saying that they're going to – the Giants will get a lot – or will get a lot of information from the Giants deciding to either spend a bit of money on an actual backup – or take a much more affordable route like a Trevor Simeon or just promote Tommy DeVito to the backup to indicate they'll probably draft somebody. Um, so there, it, there is some information that we can gather from this. Um, you know, I, I think that, that the Giants should definitely be drafting quarterback, whether it's in the first or whether it's in a different round because, you know, they need to take a chance. They need to, to bring someone in that has some upside, has some good tools. Uh, they can develop over time. But um, at the same time, you know, the quote that you kind of mentioned earlier, if Schoen has a conviction that one of these quarterbacks could be the Giants version of Josh Allen, he likely won't hesitate to trade up to secure his guy. You've said it in the past. Joe Shane was working the calls when they moved up to get Josh Allen in Buffalo. He is not afraid to make a move, guys. He is not afraid to be aggressive. This is not a guy who is going to sit there and be pretty or sit there and move back and pass on elite talent. He is going to make the move that's necessary to make the team better long term. And guys, if you can get a top quarterback and offload Daniel Jones' contract, the money you're going to save from Jones' deal is going to replace those first round picks theoretically. So in, in, in case like that's kind of my logic, you can use that money to supplement the loss of first round picks for two years or so. Um, that's kind of the bill of goods I've sold you guys before. And that's kind of how the logic I would follow um, in terms of losing those first round picks. You get money instead. You can get proven talent for your deals basically to replace those first round picks. So I kind of feel like that's an adequate option for the Giants if they want to go in that direction. But how are you feeling about this? Do you think that there's a tell if they don't go out and spend some money on a backup, do you think that'll indicate that they do want to draft somebody? Yeah, I, I think that does indicate that, or or just more so, I think that if the Giants do sign an expensive backup, it indicates that they won't go and draft somebody. It, more than the fact that if they don't sign a backup, it indicates that they will. I think it's more the reverse, in my opinion. Just because how much money can you possibly attach to your salary cap for one position? They're already attaching an egregious amount of money to the quarterback position through Daniel Jones's contract. So can they realistically afford to add another $10 million in salary cap space on a backup quarterback? plus the extra $8 million for a first-round pick at the quarterback spot? Absolutely not. They can't do that. So it would just be more so if they, if they do go out there and sign a backup quarterback, that would indicate to me that they are not drafting a quarterback in the first round. And that doesn't mean that they won't draft one later in the fourth round. Maybe Spencer Rattler sitting there in the fourth round. They view him as a developmental guy. Sure, that's possible. Uh, but just you know, speaking to the first-round quarterback prospects, I don't think that they can afford to draft a quarterback in the first round if they spend a lot of money on a quarterback in free agency. So what I think would happen is in free agency, they will probably decide, okay, Let's bring in Tommy DeVito as our full-time starting backup. That's a possibility. We know that we can win with him. Or if they do go out there and sign somebody, I think you mentioned like Trevor Simeon, somebody really cheap like that that's not going to break the bank. That's probably the, the direction that the Giants would go because they do need to add depth and also 
They need to sign a quarterback in free agency. Alex, you might be surprised to hear me say this, but they need to sign a quarterback in free agency because they can't tip their hand for the draft. If they go through the entire free agency period and offseason and lead into the draft without signing anyone for the quarterback position, then everyone will know that they plan on drafting a quarterback because they have to bring in somebody into this quarterback room, right? Because you don't have Daniel Jones uh, necessarily for week one. Tommy DeVito, yes, is under contract, but he's the only one. Tyrod Taylor is not under contract. So no matter what, the New York Giants do have to sign somebody in free agency at the quarterback position, although it can be a very low-key name and not a very good, capable starter. And again, that would indicate a first-round quarterback. But if they don't sign anybody in free agency then it's so damn obvious what they're doing in the draft. They don't sign a single backup. Everyone's going to know, okay, well, here they go. They're going to draft a quarterback in the first round. And so that's why I think when we do get over to the offseason, we get into free agency, they're going to sign someone at that quarterback spot for the reasons I just mentioned. But we'll need to be careful not to overreact one way or the other because it could also just be a way to cover up their hands for the upcoming draft. It could be like, hey, we signed a quarterback. We don't need to draft a quarterback in the first round. But the quarterback that they signed is a bum like a Trevor Simeon, so they still need to draft a quarterback. That's a possibility. Or maybe they do bring back Tyrod Taylor. And in that case, I don't think you bring back Tyrod and still go out there and draft a quarterback in the first round. So we'll have to be careful how we react to whichever quarterback they do end up signing in free agency but I predict that they will sign somebody, and if they don't, then everybody's going to know that they're drafting a quarterback in the first round. So that's kind of my take on the free agency aspect of the quarterback position. Again, how much money can they realistically allocate to that position? Not a whole lot because of how much they're already allocating through Daniel Jones's contract. But then I think the other interesting part of Dan Duggan's article, Alex, and I want to dive into this and kind of bring up... Um, one of an opinion that I have on it that I shared on social media. And it's this excerpt from his article where he says this, he says, if Shane has a conviction that one of these quarterbacks could be the giants version of Josh Allen, he likely won't hesitate to trade up to secure his guy. And I kind of want to corroborate that opinion because that's Dan Duggan's kind of opinion here, but I'll just read you some of the assets that the Buffalo bills gave up in 2018 to get Josh Allen. And then remind you, Joe Shane was the man who made these trades. He called the teams on the phone, working as assistant GM, made these offers, accepted these offers. He's the one who orchestrated these trades to get Josh Allen. So he and Brandon Bean, general manager of the Bills, had the conviction on Josh Allen. It was Joe Shane that orchestrated the whole thing to make sure that they moved up and got him. So he gave up number 21 overall in the draft, left tackle Cordy Glenn, a starting left tackle, and a fifth round pick for the 12th overall pick and a sixth round pick. And then they moved up from 12 to seven and gave up two second round picks in the process to go ahead and get Josh Allen. So that's an absolute haul that Joe Shane gave up there. Obviously the Bills, Brandon Bean had to sign off on it, but that was Joe Shane who orchestrated that whole thing. And he wasn't he wasn't afraid to give up some damn assets there. He gave up a lot. And if you look at this upcoming draft, the Giants, once again, have a lot of assets. But let's look at his work as general manager. I'm talking about assistant general manager with the Bills. How about his work as general manager of the New York Giants? Last offseason, picking 25th overall, did the Giants stick and pick? No, they moved up one spot to go ahead and draft Deontay Banks. Did they necessarily have to do that? We'll never know, but Joe Shane didn't want to take the chance. He didn't want to sit there and wait and allow somebody to jump in front of him and get Deontay Banks. He said, that's my guy. I feel a conviction on him. He's a starting corner. I'm trading up one spot to go get ahead and get him. And then he did the same thing in the third round when talking about uh, Jalen Hyatt. He moved up to make sure that nobody snatched Jalen Hyatt in front of him. So when I read that quote from Dan Duggan and I look at the history of Joe Shane, what it tells me is that the New York Giants are interested in a quarterback based on everything that we know. They're interested in drafting on a quarterback, and they're also not planning on sticking and picking at number six overall. Even if they move up one spot to five, two spots to four, doesn't matter. I have to assume that if the New York Giants do draft a quarterback in the first round, they will be trading up to get that quarterback. Joe Shane does not take chances. He risks he plays the risky game, he gambles, and he ensures that his team lands the prospect that he wants in the draft. So if the New York Giants do draft a quarterback, Alex, I will almost say with certainty and guarantee it that it's not going to be with the sixth overall pick in the draft. They won't be sticking and picking. Again, even if you feel damn confident that Jaden Daniels is on the board at four or even on the board at five and he's going to fall to the Giants at six, I bet you he still trades up the one or two spots just to make sure that nobody jumps in front of him and trades up for that guy, like we saw last year with Deontay Banks. So that's how I feel. I think that Joe Shane does have a conviction over one of these quarterbacks. I think, as we've mentioned in the past, Alex, 
Joe Shane and Brian Dable have their backs against the wall. They have to succeed this season, have to pick up wins. Otherwise, they might be on their way out in 2025. And on top of that, if they don't pick up wins, at least they could have the excuse of, okay, but we were busy developing a rookie quarterback. You know we're not going to win a ton in year one with that guy. So give us year two. And that might buy them some extra time. So I do believe that Joe Shane is going to find a conviction for one of these quarterbacks because it is such a strong quarterback class. And then I believe he's going to make a trade up, whether it's to one, two, three, four, or five, he will trade up and go ahead and land this quarterback. That's my early prediction. It's only January, almost February, and I know we got to get to April, but just piecing all these different pieces of the equation together and talking about what Joe Shane said at the Senior Bowl and the season conference, what we're hearing from reporters and insiders. How about Tony Paulina Sports Kita saying that he hears from people in the building that they want to get their quarterback? That was a report from a month ago. There's been a lot of reports. There's been a lot of rumors, and in my opinion, At the end of the day, I do believe that Joe Shane has a conviction on one of these guys. Who is it? I'm not so sure, but I think he's going to try his damn hardest to trade up at least one or two spots to go ahead and draft that quarterback in April. So that's kind of my spiel. I kind of turned this into reacting to these quotes to giving you my whole take on what I think Joe Shane is doing this offseason. But Alex, I guess I'll hear your take on my take and kind of reaction to that and what you're feeling about Joe Shane and his mindset heading into this offseason where he has a quarterback decision to make. Yeah, my take is is pretty much like what I think is going to happen and what I would like to happen. Um, what I would like to happen in a perfect world is the Bears trade with the Washington or New England a spot or two, um, and then the Giants trade with the Bears. So the Bears end up getting like a ton of capital, but we don't have to trade up to number one to get our guy because personally – I'm actually fine with any of those top three quarterbacks. Of course, they each have their different strengths and weaknesses, but I am not going to be upset if we end up with Drake May or we end up with um, Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels. I know everyone has their preference, but any three of those guys, like I'm cool with because I think they all have elite upside and elite traits. Um, Now, my preference is Jaden Daniels. That's my guy. You guys know this. Um, If we could somehow manage to trade with the Bears twice, get up to two or or three even, and get Jaden, I'd love that. But of course... What I want and what actually happens is much different. What I actually think happens is I don't think the Giants are going to draft the quarterback at all in the first two rounds. I think that they're probably going to stick at number six, and I think they're going to take the best playmaker available, whether that be Brock Bowers, whether that be Malik Neighbors, uh, Romeo Dunes. I think that there are some ridiculously talented players that the Giants are going to have a chance to get at number six, and they can't afford to pass on elite talent anymore, guys. We are constantly picking at the bottom or we're, we're, we're missing on guys that are just, you know, they could be elite, but they're not, they don't have elite traits, you know, like they're, they're developing into, into certain things. Like, um, I, I feel like we haven't been able to maximize a lot of our talent lately. Malik neighbors, if you watch him is a, an elite prospect that is going to be a good WR one immediately in the NFL. He has that type of talent. Romeo Dunes is one of the best route runners in this draft class. He is immediately going to make an impact with WR one upside. Um, Brock Bowers is a freak of nature. If you watch him play, he is immediately going to become one of the best pass catching tight ends in the game. Like that's how good he is. So uh, I I personally feel as though the Giants have a chance to get in a player that can make an impact as a premium option for them immediately. Um, If they move back, they lose that luxury. You know, those guys in the mid to late first round, if they want to move back and get more draft capital, they're not going to make an impact like that immediately. You know what I mean? Kadarius Tony was like a gadget player when he first came to us. Um, and, and he obviously ended up becoming absolutely nothing. We've seen the the, the risks of trading back are really, really high. Um, so I do think that we t- we stick, we pick our freaking top guy on the board and we and we ride into the sunset from there if that ends up becoming an opportunity and like you said if the giants are there with a chance to get a quarterback and somehow one of those top those top three guys are at three are at four where arizona cardinals are i freaking bet all the money that we are going to move up a spot or two to get to get that guy if we weren't willing to trade if we weren't willing to wait to get deontay banks we're sure as hell not going to wait to get a quarterback so you know, I think that I, I agree with you 100%. If the Giants want a quarterback, they're going to have to move up to get one, not move back. Um, I don't think moving back for J.J. McCarthy does anything for us personally, but I think moving up for one of those top three guys makes the most sense if they're going to go in that direction. However, what I think really happens is they end up taking a receiver or a, or a Brock Bowers at six. I think they take a, an offensive interior offensive lineman pass rushers in the second round. Uh, maybe even a cor- another cornerback, you know, add another rookie cornerback to the equation. Um, and I think that that's probably the way that we go if we don't go for quarterback is ultimately, as Joe Shane said today, there's a lot of knees on this roster. He said it blatantly. We have a lot of knees on this roster. So, you know, we need offensive linemen. I think we can go get Jermaine Luminor or Onwenu to cover right tackle personally. I think we need to spend a little money at right tackle. I don't think drafting another offensive tackle is the right move. we got to throw some money at it. 
someone that's preferably familiar with Bracillo's scheme. So Illuminor makes a ton of sense for us, probably at a much more affordable price tag than you know guys we've signed in the past. Uh, so you know, with that being said, I don't think we go offensive tackle. I do think we go playmakers, edge rushers, and maybe a cornerback or an interior offensive lineman in the second round. Um, so I'll kind of kick it back to you there. That, that's kind of how I feel, just because I think the probability of landing a quarterback in the top six for us is lower than 50%. So that's why I think like we'll go in the direction of playmaker. But you know my preference is trying to find a way to get Jaden Daniels. <laughs> Jaden Daniels in particular, right? Mine's Drake May. And Alex and I have been going a little bit back and forth here to give you guys some clarity on off the podcast conversations. We've been going back and forth a little bit on who we prefer at these quarterback spots. We're kind of planning on forming a little bit of a rivalry here on which quarterback we prefer. I'm a big Drake May guy. That's my number one quarterback. He's a big Jaden Daniels guy. Once we inch closer to draft season, we're going to have a lot of fun debates on the channel about which quarterback the New York Giants should target if they choose to do so. Uh, But kind of as you kick it back to me, I'll give some closing thoughts on what you said. I will say I said that the Giants... I predict they will try to move up into the top five and draft that quarterback. Although I would be remiss if I did not mention it takes two to tango. There might not be anybody willing to trade down. The Giants might not be willing to go up to their asking prices to trade up. So it's very possible that the New York Giants do not move up into the draft. But if they want a quarterback, I predict that they will be moving up for him. I do not think a quarterback gets drafted at six overall. If the Giants are sticking at six overall, I do believe they're drafting the best playmaker on the board. And that's either going to be Brock Bowers or Malik Neighbors or maybe Romo Dunze. Depends who you have your preferences on there and how you value different positions on the field. So it's going to be an interesting one. I, I agree with you, though. Trading down, I don't believe, is a big option for the Giants. He did have that quote today saying they have needs all across the the board, which would then indicate, okay, so maybe they'll try and accumulate as many picks as possible. I think that they'd be better off trading down in the second round, accumulating some more middle round picks or future middle round picks. And that would be some of the ways to address the rest of those uh, positions on the roster. But trading down in the first round, it kind of just harkens back to 2021 when the New York Giants traded down from 11 to draft Kadarius Toney at 21. Micah Parsons was on the board. He was the best defensive prospect in the draft. He was a blue chip player. They should have drafted him. And that should be the lesson learned from that that draft class. If you're picking sixth overall this draft and you have a blue chip elite day one potential all pro on the board, just don't overthink it. Take the potential all pro. Don't move down, get cute, add picks, and add three adequate starters. I think we've learned now a potential all pro player has such a greater impact than three average starters in this league. Sometimes it can be kind of a superstar dominated league. We've seen some of the best players in the NFL really elevate their teams. And I think that's the lesson for the New York Giants to learn there. So trading down, it's not that I'm super against it. I'm always for it under the right circumstances. But this season, this offseason, I don't think is the right opportunity for the New York Giants. We'll see if they do trade down. What my reaction is, of course, got to see the package. Got to see who they draft. We've got a long time till then. To, for Until then, and for now, I'm excited to dive into some of these senior bowl prospects who have been standing out. And, of course, we'll discuss those in the coming days. Discuss the combine once we get there. And, of course, start previewing some of these free agents. Do some live streams on the channel. All of that fun stuff that you guys love and ask for during this offseason. It'll all be featured right here on Fireside Giants. So, Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode. Comment your thoughts on the topics down below in the comment section. If you listen to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you all in the next one. Have a good one, and let's go Giants. Giants.